Hey guys, Spudknocker here, as always, and welcome back to DCS World. Now today we're going to be celebrating 30,000 subscribers on my YouTube channel, which is pretty freaking awesome. I had no idea this would ever happen ever when I first started making DCS World videos. In such a niche and vertical market, 30,000 subscribers is a lot, and I am definitely humbled and definitely honored that you guys love the channel enough to have that many subscribers and as many Patreon subscribers that we have. It really, really shows how much you guys love the channel. And uh, just a huge thank you to all you guys who uh, view my videos, um, fly in my missions, and participate in events, as well as, of course, the patrons who sacrifice some of their own money to help keep the channel going. Super grateful to all three groups of uh, DCS World Pilots. Now, today, um, I figured we'd talk about another kind of historical discussion. Being so hyped about the upcoming Mirage F1 um, and wanting to research further the Mirage F1 EQ, I started digging into some books, as well as a couple archival sources that I could kind of find and that were translated to English, but most of them not very well. And I found a really, really interesting little tidbit of historical information about Saddam Hussein and the Iraqi Air Force, and it definitely pertains to the F-14 Tomcat. So I figured we'd just fly a lazy cross-country flight today down the coast of Iran to the Strait of Hormuz from Kish Island and make a landing at Bandar Abbas as we have the sun setting. So let's go ahead and hop in the cockpit and get started, guys. Sometimes it's good to just kind of, you know, sit back and relax, just enjoy this unbelievably fantastic simulator here. It doesn't always have to be about combat. It can sometimes be about just enjoying the beautiful cockpits, the beautiful external models, and in this case, the beautiful user-made skin that can be downloaded on the Eagle Dynamics website. Of course, the F-14 Tomcat skin for the IRI AF. Um, as you guys know, and I've said before, um, F-14 skins that you've had and have had for a long time for your F-14B Tomcat, if you just copy and paste those into a new liveries folder for the F-14A-135-GR, those skins will work just fine on the F-14A model. So, like, without further ado, let's go ahead and punch it and uh, take off from Kish Island here and head down towards Bondar Abbas. Have a little bit of a crosswind here. And we're going to start moving our rudder pedals, of course, just to keep ourselves aligned down the center line of the runway here. Gently going to pull back on the stick. And gear coming up. And we're just blasting off here out of King Hussein, or sorry, not King Hussein, what am I saying? Kish Island Airport. Kish Island is also the site of a the largest air show that the Iranian Air Force puts on almost every year, of course, COVID year being the exception. Um, and it is one of the only chances for Western sources to get a very good look at the remaining aircraft in the Iranian inventory, namely, of course, the beautiful F-14 Tomcat, and of course the F-5 Tiger II and the, you know, sort of Iranian copies or reproductions of the F-5, and of course their F-4s, which Eagle Dynamics, man, we sure need an F-4 in DCS World. So bad, it's crazy. So please, somebody make an F-4 for DCS World. Please, please, please. An F-4E would be absolutely fantastic. All right, so we're just going to follow the coastline here. We're just going to be flying VFR, not really using too much navigation. All right. So on to the main topic. So the author, Tom Cooper, he does a lot of works, uh, you know, authors a lot of books about Middle Eastern and North African air forces. So namely um, Arab air forces from Morocco all the way to the east to Iraq, and then, of course, including the Persians, and uh, talking a lot and writing a lot about um, the Iranian Air Force, both the IIAF and the post-revolution IRIAF. And it's a lot of his stuff is very, very interesting, but and he has a lot of good insight and a lot of good access to Iran 
and Iranian pilots and Iranian former Iranian service people because of the fact that he is not American. I, I mean, I couldn't come up with a more American name than Tom Cooper. However, he's actually Austrian and holds Austrian citizenship and of course, along with that, an Austrian passport. So he has much more easy free reign through countries of the Arab world. And so he's able to talk to people um, who have firsthand experience with these aircraft and with these historical events that not many people um, have in the world besides him. He works with a lot of Arab authors. He works with a lot of Persian authors um, to bring a lot of this information to the West, which, you know, quite honestly, we don't have access to in the West. However, unfortunately, this comes with a little bit of an issue because these societies that we're talking about are so massively closed off. You know, Iran, of course, probably the most closed off government ever. Um, unfortunately, a lot of these things are kind of more or less unverifiable by secondary sources or, you know, other authors or other researchers reporting the same thing. So we kind of have to take some of it with a grain of salt, but that doesn't mean that it's any less valid or any less interesting than what I just stated. So I guess we can go ahead and throw our HUD into cruise mode. Um, I do sure wish we had a velocity vector on the HUD of the F-14, F that is. Um, and so I was reading this book that he had written about the Mirage F-1 EQ, and we're looking at the backstory of the transitional Iraqi Air Force between the kind of uh, colonial period that ended in the early 1950s through the puppet government of the King of Iraq through the mid to late 1950s through the early 1960s to mid 1960s where then you have the Republican Revolution where you have the um, Republican Party come through and take power in Iraq placing first one president in there and then of course Mr. Saddam Hussein um, conducts a coup and becomes the de facto president of Iraq from the uh, kind of latish early 1970s through, of course, to 2003, as we all know. And a lot of dictators look to the Air Force as being kind of a symbol of power, because why wouldn't you? It's a fighter jet. You know, the Air Force deals with fighter jets and bombers and fast reconnaissance airplanes and all these kinds of things that are super cool, super interesting, and for smaller countries are massive sources of pride. If you're a small country with an air force with, you know, the latest and greatest fighter jets, then man, you are on the top of the world and you can show off to the rest of your buddies. And, you know, of course, uh, Gamal Abdur Nasser, by that time when Saddam came into power, was definitely out of the picture. He was no longer the de facto leader of um, the Arab world, and so you have, of course, Saddam trying to fill that role as being the de facto leader of the Arab world, and, and kind of trying to take over that sense of uh, pan-Arabism um, after Anwar Sadat, you know, got his butt kicked in 1973 and kind of shed the role of Egypt being the leader of the Arab world. Um, post Yom Kippur War, and of course, certainly after the Camp David Accords were signed and Egypt made peace with Israel. So Saddam knows the Air Force is the key to power in the Arab world, and he is looking at his traditional enemy of Iran. Keep in mind this context is pre-1979 revolution. He's looking at Iran's Air Force and the special relationship between Iran and the Shah of Iran and saying, man, they are getting equipped with some of the best aircraft in the world. At this time, Iran is receiving F-5E Tiger IIs, F-5Fs, uh, F-4D Phantom IIs, the first country to be given F-4Ds with Zot boxes, the first country outside the United States to use laser-guided bombs in combat was Iran, of all places. Very cool and interesting little tidbit there. And they've got getting F-4Es, able to launch AGM-65 Mavericks in 1975, a column of 
um, Iraqi armor that accidentally drove across the border in a border incursion into Iran was absolutely decimated by F-4E Phantom IIs firing AGM-65 Bravos and completely destroying this column of Iraqi tanks. And Saddam is impressed. He wants a um, fleet of what he considers to be super fighters like the F-4, like the F-5, and of course the upcoming F-14A Tomcat and maybe even F-15s. So I'm reading this book and it's got this really cool little tidbit about Tom Cooper traveling to Syria in the, what was it, like uh, 2005 to 6-ish time frame and he met with and interviewed um, very briefly the head of the um, Iraqi Air Force between the years of like 1975 and 1985 when he was kind of tossed out because the Iraqi Air Force was not doing too well against the Iranians um, throughout the entire Iran-Iraq war. And then post-19, I mean 2003, U.S. invasion, this guy, he decides to flee to Syria and take refuge as a refugee in Syria. But you know, he's a pretty well-to-do guy. He's a lieutenant general. Um, his name is Mohammed Sadiq. And, um, you know, he's a pretty well-known dude in the Arab uh, world. And so Tom Cooper goes to Syria and interviews this guy at a coffee shop in Damascus. And they're talking. And um, he lays down, in my opinion, a kind of a cool little tidbit is that Saddam Hussein was an absolute rabid fan of the F-14 Tomcat. Absolutely loved the F-14 Tomcat. But... I mean, honestly, who can't love the F-14? It is the coolest jet ever. And mind you, this is, of course, pre-1986, pre-Top Gun, and the F-14 fever was not a pop culture phenomenon. Saddam wanted F-14s so badly that the, um, the SID, which was, it's an Arab acronym for the um, agency responsible for military procurement in Iraq in the 1970s made massive overtures and diplomatic uh, overtures to the United States hoping to buy the F-14 Tomcat. And these efforts were only accelerated when it came out that Iran is getting the F-14 Tomcat, so damn, we need the F-14 Tomcat too. So we want Iraqi F-14s. And... Um, you know, this was never really had that much of a path to succeeding. Iraq was, you know, kind of a, you know, a, not necessarily at that point a rogue state, but it's not the most stable of countries, you know. Saddam had just come into power through a very brutal and bloody coup in the 1960s against the British-backed king of Iraq, and so people were not that enthusiastic in the United States about selling the latest and greatest fighter jets to someone like Saddam Hussein's Iraq. Um, and Saddam went as far as having paintings of F-14s in his personal home that he had commissioned by Iraqi artists of F-14 Tomcats in Iraqi paint schemes with Iraqi roundels on their wings and fin flashes on their tail. Very cool. None of those paintings survive to this day. So it's really kind of like hearsay potentially, but it's still very interesting and very cool in my opinion. I'm sure you guys are seeing and hearing in my voice here how interesting and cool I found find this stuff. I really do. Um, and, you know, it's just really interesting. And, you know, throughout the Iran-Iraq war, you know, Iran betrayed the West. They fomented a revolution. Um, it's now a, you know, a very locked down, you know, theocros theocracy state. It's, you know, it's not good. Then, of course, we've got the hostage situation. You know, the West turns its back on Iran. And that really opened the door for the rush delivery of the Mirage F-1 EQ to uh, Saddam's Iraq which was really the most powerful and potent aircraft the Iraqi Air Force could get its hands on at that time. In even the late 1970s, in about 1979, after taking delivery and the production of F-1 EQs has started up and is going full swing in Toulon, 
in, in and in Bordeaux in France, Saddam is already looking for the replacement of the F1 EQ, the Mirage 2000. And there's actually, there was a pre-production Mirage 2000 that was painted in Iraqi colors. Um, kind of another interesting and kind of cool little tidbit there. And, you know, that's just another interesting thing. And, of course, as we know, um, the Mirage 2000 was never delivered to Iraq. The contract was signed. There were 50 Mirage 2000s in production for Iraq. Um, you know, starting up production, spinning up production for Iraq. And, of course, the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait put an end to that in 1991. However, Saddam never stopped obsessing over the F-14 Tomcat. It was always something that he really, really liked. It was just, it's a cool jet. Swing wings are cool. The F-14's awesome. Um, and he was always disappointed by the aircraft the Soviets gave him um, and his Air Force to work with. The MiG-23, 21, MiG-27, MiG-25, all very lackluster designs that really could not stand up to the F-4s, F-14s, and even F-5s of the Iranian Air Force. And of course, we do know that the Iranian Air Force is much better trained and much better equipped than the Iraqi Air Force was. And Saddam had a massive obsession with shooting down as many Iranian F-14s as possible. If he couldn't have F-14s, nobody could. And wanted to shoot down this symbol of pride of the Iranians and developed tactics for his inferior aircraft to have a chance, well he didn't develop him, the Air Force developed tactics called giraffe attack profiles where you would have um, F-14s up high in almost an early air, uh, almost an AWACS roll with their big AUG-9 radars, and you'd have Mirages fly very, very low with their radars turned off, and then using uh, ground masking to fly through the Iranian IADs, pop up, get really close to those Tomcats, pop up at the last second, turn on the radars, fire a Super 530 or a Magic at a Tomcat, and then turn around and get the hell out of there down to low level again. And of course, this worked pretty well. Um, the Iranian, or sorry, the Iraqis shot down one confirmed F-14 and a second unconfirmed F-14 in the late 1981 to 1982 period using giraffe attacks. Um, the Iranians countered this by flying with F-14s, flying high, kind of in that AWACS role, flying F-5s down low in a cap for the F-14s down low to head off those Mirage F-1 EQs going like a bat out of the hell down low to then pop up in a giraffe attack to hit those F-14 Tomcats, um, which worked really, really well. The F-5s were kind of like the early warning for the F-14s. They'd get into a dogfight, shoot down maybe some Mirages um, or potentially some MiG-23s. Um, then the F-14s would pounce on them from up above and really turn the tables back against the Iranians yet again. I'm sorry, back against the Iraqis, that is. But Saddam's... Because, you know, the West turned its back on uh, Iran, Iraq really became more or less the, the de facto ally of the West in this very strange fight in which the U.S. the and NATO particularly the British, the French, and the Soviets backed and sold weapons to Iraq while they were fighting the Iranians. I guess Iran just really screwed the pooch and they didn't have any friends left on the block. That is for sure. The Soviets, being a state that's supposed to be of all atheists, didn't like the theocracy. The Iranians taking American hostages, they didn't like that shit at all. Um, so the Iranians were on their own. The British actually made very far inroads to supplying the Iraqi Air Force with, of course, at this point in the war, we're talking 1984, 85, 86-ish. At this point, the Iraqis have no money left. They're a completely bankrupt country. And at this point, the Kuwaitis, the Saudis, and the Emiratis are actually bankrolling the Iran-Iraq war. They do not want the Shiite revolution exported to the Sunni-majority countries of the Gulf states, which are, of course, right across the water that we're flying over right now. And so the 
um, Saudis paid for the Iraqis to buy Jaguars and Tornadoes of all airplanes, Tornado IDSs and Tornado GRs, uh, the ground attack vari variant and the interceptor air defense variant of the uh, Panavia Tornado. Very, very cool, and it's something that most people do not realize at all that happened during the Iran-Iraq War. Of course, these sales fell through pretty quickly. The British public at that time, you know, post-Margaret Thatcher, post the Falklands War, did not want to be selling arms to countries that could potentially use those arms back against the British, as well as the British uh, public at this point, as well as its government, are just very much anti-war in general. However, the Saudis, of course, parlayed these contracts for Jaguars and Tornadoes for the Iraqi Air Force, just kind of turned that around and said, hey, we're paying for these jets. Um, I know you won't sell them to the Iraqis. Would you decide to just sell them to us? I mean, we're the Saudis. We're not at war with anybody. Um, we may pay for the Iraqis war, but hey, we're not doing anything to anybody. And the Saudis, you know, picked up this contract for um, Jaguars as well as Tornadoes and the Saudis still fly the Tornado to this day even though the Tornado is being uh, phased out of service across um, the countries in NATO that um, employed it for quite a long time most notably of course the Luftwaffe the uh, Regia Aeronautica the Italian Air Force um, I'm sorry that's the that's the World War II name for the Italian Air Force my bad and of course the uh, Royal Air Force, the RAF. But Saudi tornadoes are still going strong, and it looks like they will be going strong for quite a long time uh, in the future. Um, this was also kind of played politically by the Saudis, the Kuwaitis, and the Emiratis to um, the, the Saudis were using and giving intel on the Iranian uh, Air Force and Iranian moves of their ground forces to the Iraqis. And of course, the Iraqis, with their more or less inept military at this point, was just bungling everything. So the Saudis really, really wanted um, E3 AWACSs. Um, and they kind of used a bunch of uh, political machinations and behind the scenes kind of wheeling and dealing. And the tornado buy from and parlayed from the Iraqis to Saudi Arabia was kind of like a screw you America for not selling us the weapons we want in term in the form of the E3 and so that kind of willingness of the Saudis the Emiratis and the Kuwaitis to turn their buying power to the uh, British and the French kind of made the US uh, Congress at the time in the 1980s as well as uh, companies like Boeing put a lot of pressure to sell the Saudis the E3 which they got eventually and still very much fly the E3 to this day in a very upgraded form. So it's just a little tidbit that kind of has threads all over the place and it's just very very interesting in my opinion um, and it really shows how much the Air Force is just so important and such a potent symbol for these smaller countries and especially these countries that you know have pretty undemocratic governments um, we see the Air Force being incredibly consequential in coups and governmental changes throughout the uh, 20th century from um, you know Yo Ziem in South uh, Vietnam in which the coup was launched by the Air Force to um, the Islamic Republic um, after the revolution absolutely gutting its Air Force because it knew that the pilots and maintainers and members of the Air Force were so well loved by the Shah and of course there is Bandar Abbas Airport and it kind of goes to show that you know the an Air Force is a very good tool for studying the geopolitical uh, nature of a country historically because and usually despots are so weary of and coddle their air forces so much is because of the you know kind of undeniable fact that you can't really take a uneducated illiterate farmer from a rice paddy and throw him in the cockpit of an f-14 or an f-4 or a mirage f-1 or a mig-23 he has to be educated he has to be, I guess, or she, 
um, for some countries, have to be educated. They have to be literate. They have to know what they're doing. They have to have a background in engineering and maybe science or something like that. These are educated people, and so therefore pilots are dangerous. As well as a infantryman with a rifle going crazy and trying to start a, queue, a coup, not very dangerous, right? I mean, what can you really do against a government with a rifle? Not all that much. But as we saw in South Vietnam with the uh, South Vietnamese Air Force and their coup against Diem back in 1962 or 63, one of those, um, we can see at the Air Force a fighter pilot or an attack pilot with an aircraft like the A-1 Sky Raider um, back in the 1960s against Diem is an incredibly powerful force for causing havoc against a government. Far more powerful than a single guy with a rifle, but a single guy with a full ordnance load on a fighter jet or a Sky Raider, incredibly dangerous. And we even see that holding up to this day in the 21st century with the coup launched by the Air Force in Turkey, which is a altogether very interesting situation. And military coups in Turkey are actually enshrined in the country's forming constitution developed by Ataturk back in the days after World War I. Um, very interesting stuff there in that if the military and the military believes that the government of Turkey has become too religious, too unsecularized, because of course Ataturk was a very secular figure, um, you the, it is enshrined in the Constitution of Turkey that the military must perform a coup against the government, install a military government, and then, of course, um, restart it back again with democracy, with a secular government elected into power by the people. Which, the military, specifically the Air Force of Turkey, took this very seriously, and they launched a coup against the current Turkish president, and unfortunately it failed um you know there's nothing in the constitution that says the the despot or the theologist who's trying to bring the country back to the days of the ottoman empire and theologistic uh governmental rule um can't fight back against it you know and it can't be really you can't really blame them for fighting back against a coup against them so it's kind of very interesting stuff and i hope you guys enjoyed this video and I hope you learned something and I enjoy just enjoying a relaxed um, cross-country flight and talking with you guys I can always talk all day about this kind of stuff 400 300 200 And here we are, on the ground safely at Bondar Abbas International Airport. On a side note, interesting side note, I guess, uh, Iranian pilots who are flying F-14s these days are not allowed to manually sweep the wings because that can potentially break the aircraft and break the wing sweep mechanisms and cause more wear and tear on them. And so you'll always see Iranian F-14s taxiing with their wings swept fully forward. This VDI gets real bright real quick, don't it? I don't like red on the VDI though. I don't really like the red HUD either, but it's the best we can do. So 
like I said, I, I hope you guys thought or think that this video is interesting. I hope you learned something, and I hope it means that you'll go and research this stuff yourself because it is so, so fascinating, at least to me. And it is, these kinds of little stories and things are one of the main reasons why I love DCS World so much and its plethora of aircraft and why I find aviation history so interesting. Um, and it's why in my videos I like to fly foreign jets other than American jets so often because it gets kind of boring with gold gray jets all the time in US roundels. And so it's fun to fly airplanes with funky camouflage patterns and different country fin flashes and roundels on the aircraft like uh, Kuwaiti Hornets or Greek F-16s or Iranian F-14s. Um, it just is a lot more fun and a lot more interesting in my opinion. So like I said, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and uh, please give it a like and a subscribe and thank you so much for 30,000 subscribers. It's quite the milestone that I really didn't think I'd ever reach. And I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but I tend to like the lighting on the Persian Gulf map a little bit better than the lighting on the Syria map. It's just kind of something that I think things look a little bit better on the Persian Gulf map when it comes to lighting. So, like I said, hope you guys enjoyed the video, and uh, we'll see you in the next one.